As we embrace this urgency of creating the beloved community, now is the time to be loved. Love means understanding, redemptive goodwill toward all which seeks nothing in return. So be loved by implementing the demands of justice to eliminate the school to prison pipeline that has so many black children entrapped. Be loved by correcting voting policies that seek to suppress the votes of millions of black and brown people. Be loved and implement the demands of justice by transforming a society that is disproportionately violent toward black lives, including black transgender lives and indigenous lives. Be loved and correct false narratives and economic policies that continue to divide and pit poor and working class black and white people against each other. Be loved and implement demands of justice where systems and structures are deconstructed and lead the way of living in community that reimagines just humane, equitable, and sustainable policies, practices, and behaviors. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them who hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and abuse you. Be loved and do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Beloved Community Talk. Welcome, my beloved community, and thank you for joining the King Center's beloved community talks from all over the globe. I believe that today's talk will be a powerful start to a very necessary conversation that we as a nation and individuals need to have on the power of unlearning. In 1967, uh, my father left us with a clarion call in his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. He stated amidst revolutionary times, such as we have now, that together we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or together we will be forced to perish as fools. I truly believe that learning to unlearn is a critical step in transforming our lives and the world we live in. Uh, now, before I dive into today's conversation, I wanna share with you uh, that in four days on June 26, the King Center will celebrate its 53rd anniversary. 53 years ago, my mother, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, founded the King Center less than three months after my father's assassination on April 4th, 1968. About the King Center, this is what she said. Just as at its best, the White House is viewed in the United States as the people's house, the King Center and its offshoots would offer a snapshot of what the beloved community in the World House could become. What a powerful idea. One that undergirds our vision here at the King Center, which we envision the beloved community where injustice ceases and love, that's right, love prevails. The experiences and programs we provide, including our Nonviolence 365 education and training, Camp Now Youth Leadership Academy, soon to be our beloved Community Leadership Academy, Students with King, beloved Community International Expo, and our beloved Community Talks, such as the one you are a part of right now are purposed and designed for us to lead the way in making the beloved community a reality. As my mother said, the beloved community is a realistic vision of an achievable society, one in which problems and yes, conflicts do exist, but are resolved peacefully and without bitterness. She also stated, that in the beloved community, caring and compassion drive political policies that support the worldwide elimination of poverty and hunger and all forms of bigotry and violence. This year, many of you may know that we launched our Be Love campaign, which really is a global movement for justice with the beloved community as its ultimate goal. Be Love includes a 
virtual Be Love training series and a virtual nonviolence training series. We hope you will join us in this Be Love movement by visiting thekingcenter.org um, and taking the pledge and then signing up for our trainings. In addition to Be Love, we continue to call people up, that's right, up, not out, to higher places to nonviolent, constructive, strategic conversations as modeled by our beloved community talks. The love community talks are courageous conversations, purpose to yield compassionate, nonviolent action that creates the beloved community. Today, I'm excited for this particular beloved community talk about the power of unlearning. I'm joined by a guest who is influence, influencing the world with her art and with her heart for humanity. I'm thrilled to have Lady Gaga, Grammy Award winning recording artist, join me for the first of what will be a two part conversation. Um, I hope you will join us next time as well and we'll tell you more about that at the end of this conversation. This past January, during the King Center's Beloved Community Awards, we presented Lady Gaga with the Yolanda D. King Higher Ground Award. I was of course very moved by her remarks about her personal journey and her willingness to admit that she had to unlearn some white supremacy ideologies. I was moved because many people of influence, especially our white brothers and sisters, are fearful about dealing with white supremacy and white privilege, and even more fearful to boldly use their platforms. And even now, this is becoming a great challenge in light of the battle around the critical race theory that is seeking to uh, inhibit, prohibit, and deny the opportunity for schools, public school systems around this country to teach about uh, the linkage between racism and white supremacy and how it impacts us in our systems and structures and policies today. Just recently, we acknowledged the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa ma massacre. And yet we still find ourselves in polarizing debates regarding this critical race theory. We must all understand and acknowledge there is a great deal of information that is missing or omitted from our history. And from some, a term like unlearning may seem to be antithetical. However, as you will discover through tonight's conversation, unlearning, in fact, is calling on all of us. And I mean each and every one of us, regardless of our race, nationality, and ethnicity, to dismantle false inaccurate and harmful information and replace these thoughts with truth and accurate history that elevates our abilities to understand the painful truths, rich truths, and even triumphs of the past. Unlearning challenges each of us to do, each of us to do our personal and collective work to unlock our own biases or beliefs that keep us from justice, equity, and agape love. Of course, we all have some things we need to learn and unlearn to do our part in creating the beloved community. I welcome each of you to join us on this journey of learning that the power of transformation lies in our willingness to unlearn and dismantle the systems that hindered the creation of the beloved community from being realized. So now let us dive into tonight's conversation as we share a bit of Lady Gaga's incredible journey to unlearning that she shared earlier this year during our Beloved Community Awards. I believe the Beloved Community is possible when and if people who look like me, other white people, commit to something I call unlearning. In my core, I feel that I am you, and you are me, we are each other. Honesty and kindness are values I live by every day. And it is with these values that I want white people to know that tonight as I talk about unlearning, I am speaking to you. Black lives matter. Black life matters. Blackness matters. Black joy matters. White people, I believe that black life represents the best of our nation. And as white people, I believe we have a responsibility to unlearn. 
to accept the honest truth about the history of our country, admit that white supremacy makes us unhealthy, and change our own behaviors to contribute to a world where freedom is real for everyone. White people, I believe we must right our wrongs without shame. We must change our actions, and we must do this for ourselves. This is just one of our roles in the beloved community. Wow. That was powerful. That was poignant. And that was potent. I want to take time now to welcome Lady Gaga. Hello, Dr. Good evening. Thank you. Good, good evening. How are you? How are you feeling today? I, I'm feeling good. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm happy to be here. I'm glad you are with us. And um, I'm glad for us to continue conversations we've started before now. Um, and I want to start with this. Um, you said in that same acceptance speech that unlearning is a gift of your life. And so tonight, um, I'm going to look at this as an opportunity to unwrap that gift uh, to, the, to the public uh, for us to experience that, that journey. Because I think uh, you have some personal insight um, because you've done some very deep work um, just in our conversation um, that we had on last week, it is very evident that you have been doing some very deep, deep work in this, in this area. And um, I want people to, to hear your heart um, and, and to go with you on this journey and perhaps dare to go on that journey themselves. Because as I said earlier, uh, this whole notion of unlearning um, is not just for any one particular racial group. It's for all of us as a part of Humanity is a part of the beloved community, is a part of what my father called uh, the world house because white supremacy is something that we were all born into. Um, when we arrived, those systems and structures of, of operating and believing and thinking um, and behaving were in place. Um, and uh, we've all been impacted by it in different ways. And so what, what I wanna ask you uh, starting out is when was that moment for you um, where the journey really started and you realized um, that I have a responsibility uh, to unlearn? Because I think most people, the conversation is about learning. You know, my dad, as I said earlier, said we must learn to live together. But the reality is kind of like when you go through um, a, a program where you're trying to lose weight, one of the first things that uh, people who are experts in that area uh, try to tell you is that it's important for you to detox first before you really try to introduce all those good foods into your, your body. And so tell us, wh when did it all start, that journey? What, what opened it up for you? Well, what I would say is first and foremost, that journey began with a deep, deep desire in my heart to love the world. However, I knew that there were both assumptions made about me and assumptions I made about myself, that I felt that I had already an understanding about equality and fighting for people, for the world. And what I noticed was that when it came to the LGBTQ plus community, I had this endless ability to talk about love, this endless ability to be fearless this endless ability to dive into myself, to go to Capitol Hill, to yell at the president, can you hear me? Talking about don't ask, don't tell, talking about marriage equality. And then when there was so much racial unrest in this country last summer, I realized that I was having a hard time talking. Mm. I was having a hard time knowing what to say. And I realized there was this blockage in me and people around me were asking me, what do you think about this? What do you have to say about this? Speak out about this. And at first I thought, I don't wanna to be too technical. I don't wanna speed this up. I don't wanna say the wrong mm -hmm. thing. I wanna take my time. And I did some writing. But when I look back on that writing, it was intellectual. Mm -hmm. I feel like I hid behind concepts the idea of systemic racism. And what I realized later was that I had to ask myself a much bigger question. What is wrong with me? 
that I cannot have this conversation? What is wrong with me that I am having trouble talking? And I began to do the work myself. The process of unlearning is a work of love, I believe. It's a work of love to mm -hmm. yourself and it's a work of love to the people around you. And I, I wanted to understand what am I, what am I missing? And Dr. King, I was missing so much. And that unlearning process began with me knowing that I had to start edifying what I believe and being able to really speak about it in a way where I can be strong, rooted in love, rooted in my truth, staying engaged and making agreements with myself. But this, it, it took me making mistakes. And it also took me really looking in the mirror and saying, what is wrong with me that I can't talk about this? So, so what, do you, what were some of the assumptions that you had to come face to face with, that you had to challenge in yourself? Well, I assumed that I was somebody that knew so much about equality, that I fought for equality in the LGBTQ mm. plus community, that I believed so strongly in equality, that I had an understanding of equality, that my understanding of equality mm. was connected also to my relationship with God. And then I learned something by unlearning. And actually quite recently, I was watching something Eddie Glaude talked about, equality and the center of gravity around whiteness. And I thought to myself, isn't that interesting that I could not see that equality is calibrated to white. It's not mm. calibrated to all of us right now. And mm. I thought to myself, that is something that I did not see before. That is something that I did not understand before. The way that white supremacy culture is rooted in everything around me that I would not be able to know that there that the equality could stand on its own maybe one day with, with our imaginations by coming together in a new way, making change, changing policy, that can we change the center of gravity and orbit around something other than whiteness? And how do we do that? And how do we do that? <laughs> well, how do, how do we do that? I'm curious to know what you think about that. And I have some <laughs> thoughts too. Woo! Well, <laughs> I mean, you, you you started on the the journey. I mean, it's 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 this whole uh, unlearning and getting in spaces of uncomfortability, um, and exploring something new and different um, that many people um, may not want to do, but it's going to take um, a critical mass of us to do it. Um, so. I don't know. I, I, I know it's getting harder, you know, with everything that's happening now with the critical race theory. Um, and, and so, you know, I don't know. You, you, you tell me. Well, one of the ways that I'd like to speak to white people through this conversation about this process, I believe, is that in speaking in spaces of white affinity, we can start to edify what we believe. And I started with two women that I love so much, two white women that I respect. And we started to talk about it. And as I started to really relax into what I believe, mm -hmm. then I started to talk to my family. Then I started to talk to my friends, my colleagues. And then I started to, in business conversations or in social gatherings, I started to interrupt. And in some of these spaces, they were white spaces. In some of these spaces, these were mixed race spaces. But for me, that concentric circle of you where it starts by changing your insides first and then working outwards to share your story, share your journey with others, I believe that's just one of the ways that we can be a part, white people, of building the beloved community by making it our responsibility to use our white power to unlearn. And you said you started first within the group that's closest to you, the group that loves you, first and foremost, your family. Um, tell me how that was. How did they receive it? Because I think a lot of people, the, the gap is taking that leap um, and feeling 
like it's okay to take it and I won't, I won't be harmed by it. Uh, it's, there's so many, uh, I won't say so many, there are a few white people I know that that first step is very difficult. What is gonna happen to me? Who's gonna abandon me? Um, how did you deal with, or did you even have any fear? Well, I think I, I think I understand this question. I think what you're, you're saying is, is uh, how did I arrive at that space with my family where I could talk to them about this? Is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. How did you, a lot of people are afraid in the white community of losing connection with family, with yeah. friends, um, by having these kinds of conversations. How did you take that leap? I mean, in, in our Christian faith, there's a, there's a scripture that said, perfect love cast out fear. And I earnestly believe when you come from a place of, of pure love, then those fears begin to dissipate. It doesn't mean in the end that people may not decide to sever ties, but at least within you, you have a sense of, of peace and wholeness because you knew you came from that space and that place and, it, and, and you only meant um, good from, from, the, from the journey, from the conversation. Yeah. Well, for myself, I consider myself to have two families. I have a family that gave birth to me biologically, and then I have my artistic family and my colleagues. In terms of my family that gave birth to me, this was a conversation I was, I was quite nervous to have, but in these spaces of white affinity, I learned about discomfort and productive discomfort. And I would like to mention just for a moment, uh, a sort of a step ladder of something that I find quite interesting. There's, uh, you know, step one, step two, step three, and step one underneath is this sort of hypo arousal. It's where mm -hmm. there's an avoidance, uh, a lack of interest in talking about this topic. Then on the third step above, there's this very hyper arousal where it's quite emotional and people get so nervous about talking about it that they can't. And mm -hmm. then somewhere in the middle, there is this productive discomfort that I believe is a wisdom. And it's a wisdom to know that this is important work that starts with, starts with you and that it's okay to be afraid in these moments. Now, when I talked to my father, when I talked to my mother, when I talked with my sister and her, uh, her loved ones, I always remembered to make sure that I was saying the words, mm -hmm. I believe this. And also I would ask my father, my mother, I'd say, I'm curious to know why you would say something this way? Have you ever thought about saying it in another way? Have you ever thought about the ways in which we are white? So for example, uh, white supremacy culture to me has some characteristics, I'll name a few right now. Defensiveness, a celebration of uh, quantity over quality, uh, competition, perfectionism. These are all things I believe that are also resonating at the same time with this idea of technicality and speed. And I asked the people around me that were white, that were in my family, what are the ways that we can slow down so that we can see the world? What are the ways that we can unlearn this speed, unlearn this need to faster, number one, competition all the time, and sit back and look at the complex, important problems around us and come together in love. So I always spoke from a place of I believe, and I also implored questions, hard questions. And I, I was at times afraid of the answer. And also I was unafraid of the answer because I was happy that we were having these conversations at all. Hmm. In Can terms you, of- Go ahead. Go ahead and finish. And, and also, in, in terms of uh, my other family, and I have a lot of colleagues that are people of color that I love deeply, that I make art with, that I have so much of my life experience and my career with, that were also so graceful with me in the ways that they made it very clear to me what I could not see. And I, I, was, so I, I took my time to receive that 
to hear that and to make that also part of my unlearning for that to be a sign that I had to do this work. And I, so I took that, I started my unlearning on my own in those white affinity spaces. And then I started speaking slowly. And I, it's like I said, I, I really thought about those, those, that, those stages of disequilibrium. And I tried to make sure I was always in the center there so that I could be productive and that I could make this a lifelong forever work of unlearning and that I would make it clear to those around me that this was not just a conversation we were having today, but this is a conversation I would keep having. So I want, I want to emphasize something because I can imagine as people are listening, uh, as you say, those that look like you especially, um, I think it's important that they hear uh, this process that you're talking about because sometimes in our anxiousness um, to do something and to get something right and to change something, um, we miss important processes. So I wanna go back because you started by saying there was the internal work that you did. You started asking some very fundamental questions of yourself when you found um, your speech paralyzed uh, when it came to the issues around um, the black community. Um, and so you started inwardly. And I, I wanna say that uh, to everybody that if we are going to create an outward reality of the beloved community, it really starts in each and every one of us. There's work that we all have to do um, to unlearn systems and structures, biases, um, and things that we have been all raised in in this in this nation um, that has created a lot of harm and a lot of damage and a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. Um, but this internal journey is where it all started. And then as you move through that space, it doesn't mean you not, are not continuing to do that internal work <laughs> because each step along the way, you're, you're confronted with something else that you have to ask other questions about. Um, but you did then began to um, do some work within the safer spaces first, um, which is, you know, your, what you call your family. And that's defined different ways by different uh, people as to what that is. Um, and then now you're sitting on this platform. I don't know how, how many times you've had these conversations um, about unlearning on public platforms, uh, but I can imagine that this is one of a few that you've had. Um, and there's more that you're gonna do. I'm, ima I'm imagining, because you said this is a lifelong um, mission for you. Uh, so uh, the question I wanna ask you is, how do we help people who are in seats of privilege? And, and, and that can be in many ways, uh, but seats of privilege uh, who may not be aware of the things that they need to learn to learn. Um, what, is, what is your advice to them? Well, speaking to white people, my advice to them would be to look inside yourself and also look around you and try to understand the ways that white supremacy culture is at play all the time. And I mean, when I say all the time, I mean, I do this every day, constantly. I am always keeping my eyes open. Unlearning gives me new eyes to see the world. And when I see it, I point it out and I can point it out to myself first and say, okay, I saw that and reflect on that moment. And then I start to notice these things happen and I start to speak. But what I would say to people of privilege that are white, that I would, I would really, really encourage you to do some deep, deep unlearning on the ways that you collude with, right, with white power, with white supremacy in, in business, in work, in the way that you do or do not talk about these issues. I would ask you, to, I would implore you to, to edify what you believe. And, you know, I'm trying to think of, of a concrete story, because I feel like through stories, sometimes I can answer this, these questions better. When I sang the national anthem uh, at the inauguration this year, 
the day before I went to see where I was going to be standing. And I walked in with a bulletproof vest on because we were nervous about being right. in the Capitol. <laughs> yeah. And somebody said to me, would you like to see the Capitol today? And I said, no, because I wanted to get in and get out. Mm. And then I went in and I saw where I was going to stand and sing. And I was finished with the walkthrough of the sh show, <laughs> which was a beautiful day. Mm -hmm. But as I was leaving, I stopped myself. And I said, why did you say no, that you don't want to see the Capitol today? And it was because I didn't want to see the place where the insurrection had taken place. And mm -hmm. I went back to that woman that asked me and I said, my apologies, I'd like to see the Capitol. And then I walked through the Capitol like a detective and I looked for evidence of the truth because we see mm -hmm. these things on screens, right? right. We witness these things on the news, but to be there in person, I was afraid. Dr. King, I knew in that moment, I was avoiding this issue and I stopped myself and I said, don't avoid it, go look at it and go be with it. And guess what I did? I just walked through and I searched until I found, they said, they, they told me, they said, you won't find much, we've, we've cleaned up most of it. But I found a window that had mm. blunt force that was cracked. And I went to that window and I stared at it and I saw the white rage. Mm. And I stared at it and I reflected and I thought about what I was about to do the next day. And I thought about what a gift this unlearning was also to myself that I would take that moment to go there and see it for myself because that day to me was not about Donald Trump. That day to me was about white supremacy. And it was a day that we could all take our hands and point right at it where it was crystal clear. These are the ways in which I, I believe that we all can unlearn. It's when, we, it's when we notice ourselves avoiding, when we notice ourselves colluding, when we notice ourselves not stopping to ask ourselves hard questions. Now, this even shows up for me in business. Sometimes somebody, somebody the other day said to me, um, what does it mean to you that, uh, uh, creative freedom is power. And I found myself while I was talking to them, thinking about what power meant, what power meant to the person that was talking to me, what power meant to me. Mm -hmm. And I said to them, well, I want to be clear that we are celebrating earned power and not unearned power. Right. And yet, while I was saying that, I also continued to ask myself, is that the right thing to say? Did, mm -hmm. Is that the right, right way to frame this? And also, there are centuries of moral healing that we have to do so that we as white people can be unafraid to have these conversations and to ask ourselves the ways in which we are blind. Why did I hold on for so long to not seeing color? I do not know, but I need to see color because when I see color, I can see the truth. Yes. Thank you for saying that because so many people take my father's uh, words out of context when he said my four children would live in a nation where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. By no means was he talking about a colorblind uh, world. But I want to ask you something. Um, there's so many people, obviously, um, who don't think like you. <laughs> um, who would probably feel that there is no such thing as racism today. Huh. Um, a lot of people who are uncomfortable with the notion of white supremacy and who feel like when these conversations are happening, fingers are being pointed at them. How do we invite that community in um, without them feeling threatened, but in a way that they can feel like this is a journey that all of us need to be on for the sake of even them and, and, and our whole humanity. How, how do we do that? Well, 
In other words, how do you reach your other white brothers and sisters who, you know, as soon as you start saying white privilege, white supremacy, right. they're going to shut down. I know. I know. <laughs> I start saying white, whiteness, white power. I, I Listen, I, I've been in those conversations in those rooms and I see the bristle happen. Yeah. Right. You know what I would say? And maybe this is a. Maybe this is not particularly radical to anybody. Maybe this would be quite radical to some people, but I believe that white people want to change. And I believe that white people want to unlearn. And I believe in white people. And I believe in having compassion for white people that they don't know how to hear those words without getting defensive, without trying to protect themselves, mm. without trying to hoard power, without trying to keep themselves on top. You know, I, when I think about the, you know, the zero sum uh, uh, theory, I think that like it's, it's deeply ingrained in our minds in this way that we need to unlearn that if a person of color gets plus one that we are now like that it's minus one for white people. And I, I would invite them to know that other white people believe in other white people that they want to do this work and change and that there, that there is love here, that this is not a conversation about white supremacy in a way that it is designed to hurt you. It's, a, it's done in a way that is designed, I believe for myself, it's designed to educate me about things that at one time I could not see. But now if I were to describe white supremacy, I would say I could stand in the center of an eight ball and point all the way around through 60 that it's all around me. And once we start to have these conversations from a place of love where maybe white people can say to other white people, I believe in you. I believe you want to unlearn because I, I've got so many white friends. I'll tell you that I white folks that the I can feel them that they want to be able to talk to me about it, but they don't know how. And very often I, I feel myself saying to them, I know how much you want to unlearn and you just have to begin the process and you just have to start to try and be braver in that moment. Be brave enough to feel that discomfort, discomfort. be brave enough to hear these words and accept them as they're a bitter truth and we cannot lie. I mean, I, I have this book and I feel that it's important to, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to say this quote to you if it, if it felt relevant. It's a, uh, from a book by Kiese Lehman. It's called How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America. Mm -hmm. And when he's speaking about uh, social antagonism, he says in an, it, it is an addiction broken only by honest reckoning consistent practice and the welcoming of radical spirits. What I believe is that we can, I can speak to other white people and white people can speak to other white people with love and say, I believe in you. This is a practice, we ha this is a discipline. This is honest reckoning. We can do this together. We can sit in this together and we can be a part of, embracing radical spirits to move us forward so that the beloved community can continue to grow. But I understand why you asked me this question because it is my feeling that white, white supremacy is like, it's the pipes, right? And we're the water of love and we're, we're exploding with love that we want, we want out of these pipes, but we're still water in the pipes. And how do we get out? And I believe one of the ways that we can get out, one of the ways that we can speak to other white people is to tell them, white people telling other white people, I believe that you want to unlearn. I believe in you. I believe you want to be part of the change. So this, this process that we're talking about, I think it's important to, to emphasize that this is a process of addition, perhaps even multiplication and not subtraction and division. I, I, I think that there's so many people um, who feel like by opening up this world where we all can see each other and value each other um, fully um, and create a society where there is equity and there is a sharing of resources, um, and people are treated with dignity and respect and that justice can be a reality. 
that we are actually adding to humanity and we're not subtracting some, taking something away. And I think that's what people hear oftentimes that if, if I say anything about white supremacy and I start moving away from these, these notions that I am subtracting from me and we have to help them to understand that that's not what's happening at all. So um, let's talk about that. Um, these are, you, you said it, everybody has said it. These are social constructs that we have created. Humans, you know, um, we've created. And so we collectively, and there's constructs that have, that all of us have participated in in some way or another. Um, um, and, and this is somewhat of a, a risky statement to make, but believe it or not, if everybody in the universe addresses their own personal biases, and let's just say even black people, a black person in power without us addressing these social constructs can actually perpetuate white supremacy through these racial systems because we as humans have to undo these systems that we have created based off of this, this notion of superior and inferior. Um, so um, my question is, you know, do you feel in the bottom, from the bottom of your heart that we not only have the power, but that we will deconstruct white supremacy in, 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 in our lifetime? <laughs> That's one whole question, Dr. King. In our lifetime. And I know, I you know, that's relative because we don't control when our last breath is, but you, in, right. in terms of lifespan, you get But I, I believe I understand what you're asking me. And this is what I believe. I believe that if we operate on that level that you're talking about, that's that, that's that unconscious competence. That's the ability mm. for us to open our minds to knowing that when white is at the top, all the time that we are missing out on life when the when when equality is not equal because it's always mm -hmm. calibrated to white, white that we are missing out on the world we are missing mm. out on so much humanity and we're yeah. we're living in this space and we have we, we're miss it, it, it's like the cultural iceberg right we're up here and we're missing all the depth we're living mm -hmm. on the surface mm. and what I would say is that I do believe that there will be a day, someday that we walk hand in hand, eye to eye with humility and hope. In healing with more wholeness, but this only can be done if white people and other people that look like me begin this process of unlearning and make it a lifetime effort so that we can see it in this lifetime so that we can understand that when we have that white power when we have that white privilege we need to use that power and that privilege to educate ourselves and educate other white people but i do believe this is possible now i was listening to imani perry talk about utopias the other day and she said that she didn't believe in utopias um which I thought was interesting, but I don't think what you're talking about is necessarily a utopia. Mm -hmm. I think what you're talking about is a world where equality is not centered in gravity of white, mm -hmm. but that we orbit around each other, that yes. we orbit around culture, that we take a step back. These systems have to change and we can change these systems, but we have to organize around love. Exactly. So, and that's what and, I and, believe. How do we organize around love? And, and that's one of the reasons we launched this, uh, this Be Love um, campaign, because most of us just, we don't know about that kind of unconditional understanding, redemptive goodwill toward all love. Um, 
and it's it's the only way that we're going to get there. Um, and and so um, you know, I invited you the other day to to join us on this uh, on this journey of uh, this be love journey um, as we try to um, in in infect the world with something that uh, is is really is really organic to us. We just don't know it. Um, we, we've we've allowed ourselves to be exposed to so many other things that we've lost sight of of the organic of who we really are. Uh, and so, just in closing, um, I wanted to ask you to share with everybody something you shared with me the other day. I thought it was so powerful um, when we were talking. You talk. You said that I think you said you had an allergy. <laughs> to the poison of white supremacy. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know, I believe, I believe now through my process of unlearning and learning, I believe we all drink the poison of white supremacy when we're young, when we're first mm -hmm. born. And that part of the unlearning process is, you know, for lack of a better uh, analog, it's like, it's like, how do we throw up this poison? But what I've realized is that I actually have noticed a change in my body. When I do this work, I feel warm. Mm. When I organize around love and I stop orbiting around whiteness, I feel hugged. I feel loved. Mm. I feel the world in a way that I've never felt it before. And when things around me start to speed up, and we start to, I start to experience that, that white supremacy culture speeding up around me, that competition, perfectionism, beyond time, let's go, you know, hoarding power. When that starts to happen, I feel like I'm allergic to it now because I've been doing this work and I start to feel this tingling in my body. I start to feel heat all around me. And I, and I start to feel disconnected from the people around me. And sometimes in, in, in meetings, I've been in Dr. King, if people have started shouting at each other, at each other over God knows what, bless. <laughs> I would write the word adaptive on a post-it, stick it on the wall and walk out of the room. And that would be mm. my way of interrupting. And I would walk back in and I would say, I don't know what you were fighting about, but I know that this is not the way to solve the problem. And what is a more adaptive solution? Can we take a step mm. back and look at this? But I notice it because I, 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 I'd like to ask other white people to look inside themselves and ask themselves, are there moments throughout your day or in your life where you notice this very rushed feeling inside of you, hmm. that like you have to keep up with something. And I would, hmm. I would beckon white people to ask themselves, are you keeping up with white supremacy culture? Hmm. Or are, are you keeping up with another idea that you have? But I beckon you to ask the question, is it that? Because it might be because it was for me. And when I deny that of myself, meaning when I notice it, and that's part of my unlearning is my ability to see that now. When I notice it, I slow down, I take a breath, and I either interrupt or remove myself. And I start to take a, an approach that is inspired by everybody. But it's not, it's not inspired by white supremacist culture. It's inspired by relationships, mm -hmm. community. It's inspired by deep culture, love, the celebration of all, but not this unconscious incompetence. I wanna bring this up again as we talked about bias earlier because this unconscious incompetence, I'm using this as a strong word incompetence to, to, and, and, it, and it sits right alongside ignorance that mm -hmm. white people hold onto very strongly. And when you hold on to that, you are committing yourself to oppression. And I ask white people to ask yourself, do you realize that you're doing that? And maybe in that moment, when you feel that thing in your body, are you committing to oppression without even realizing it? And can you mm -hmm. hold yourself back? And can you unlearn 
And then can you find these spaces, whether it, whether they're white affinity spaces or they're mixed race spaces, to have these conversations and then have these conversations with your families and move out. I'm sorry to keep going on about this, but I'm trying to tie in what we were talking about earlier to this feeling in my body so that everyone could understand, the white people that are listening, that if you are feeling sometimes like you do not belong, that you are trying to keep up with something, you might have this allergy that I have to this, you might have this allergy allergy to there being an absence of love and a dominance of whiteness. And that's just what I believe. But I do believe white people want to change. I do believe not all white people know how. And I do believe that some white people are so filled with rage around this topic that it's difficult for them to talk about. But I do know that change is possible because I, I, knew, I know it's possible inside myself, which means I know it's possible in somebody else. Wow, this this is uh oof. there there's a there was there's been a lot to uh, chew on tonight, um, and uh, as you were talking, I thought about my my father's words that there's nothing in all the world more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity, um, and uh, you you're you're talking about a a liberation. Um, that frees the world, you know. Um, it's not just about white people do going on this journey to get themselves straight. It's it's about it's about what Daddy said as as perfect. I think he even said perfect. Perfect love is just as concretized. It, it's it's this journey where as you open up yourself to be a vessel for love to flow in and through, um, you become this, um, this, this, this liberated person that is not even self-oppressed because a lot of this is also self-oppressing. You know, if, if, if it's true that white people do wanna unlearn and don't know how to. I think there's some people in the black community who would say, uh, I don't know about that <laughs> because the, the yeah. they've seen such rage and unrepentance in so many, especially in so many officers faces to some of those on Capitol Hill who are holding hostage, you know, important pieces of, of legislation. Um, and, uh, you know, this journey of unlearning can't come quick enough for many people. Um, but the most important thing is that the space where you are and the, in, the influence and the power that you have in your platform, hopefully, um, will begin to plant important seeds so that people can begin to not just theorize, as you call it, performative anti-racism. Yes. Um, and they move sincerely to this space where they are implementing out of love, the demands of justice, as dad said, um, and using love to correct everything that stands against love, um, legislatively, conversationally, as you did in that room, where you put adaptive, we call that, helping people to come to terms with how do we create these win-win um, outcomes and scenarios. So thank you for this conversation. I wish we could talk longer, they're telling me it's time to wrap. <laughs> I know, me too. I, I, I did want to say to you um, that I didn't mean to earlier, you mentioned critical race theory, and I actually, I didn't mean to dodge that question there. I I got so uh, I got so moved by our conversation that I, it got lost. Bec and I think it got lost because uh, of, of this uh, simple truth that I believe. I believe that Republicans weaponize critical race theory and I believe that they weaponize love all the time to gain power and to divide us, to conquer for more of that white power. So I would invite other white people to potentially have conversations about how this is just one of the things that, are, that, are, that is used to divide us. And in what ways can we fight for there to be a curriculum or something in schools for the kids at a young age? Like I would have loved when I was younger a young white girl that I would have been taught 
that I was born into centuries of unearned power. These are the, th that's the type of education discussion I wish that we were having. So I didn't want to dodge right. that question from you. Right. So I no, just no, wanted no. to bring I, it back to that. I, I understand perfectly. Um, and the reality is that at some point we have to move beyond politicizing everything so that we can do the real work of creating a just, humane, equitable, and, and peaceful um, world. Those are those are our, those are members of our beloved community. They are brothers and sisters, um, and we have to find a way to bridge and 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 invite them on the journey with us to unlearn. And so, thank you so much, uh, Lady Gaga. I look forward to um, continuing our conversations even offline. Um, and thank you for making time tonight to to join us. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. Uh, this was a very important. Uh, critical conversation, especially in light of um, the times that we are living in, the polarized times, the divisive times, you know, the attacks um, on uh, critical race theory, on voting rights. Um, these are conversations that are necessary and essential because we have to beat the enemy, not people that's trying to defeat us as humanity. Um, Daddy called them the triple evils of poverty, racism, um, and militarism. And through love, we can be love and we can conquer those things. So I told you it was gonna be powerful uh, tonight. It's, it, it has been, and I cannot thank Lady Gaga enough for her willingness to be vulnerable and transparent this evening. Thank you for, for that transparency and that vulnerability. I think it helps so many people. Uh, thank you, so Dr. as I close, King. thank you so much. As I close tonight, I want to emphasize the importance of grace and love on all of our journeys to unlearning because without question, our journeys will, will come with missteps. Let's be honest, we, we've all made missteps. We've all made mistakes. Uh, some of the mistakes um, have, have, have created um, pain and suffering for generations of people and continue to do so. Um, and we have to do what is radically necessary to turn that around. But if we center our, if we center love in our efforts, as, as Lady Gaga kept talking about this, this, you know, actually gravitating from love instead of whiteness or any other notion that we have come up with in humanity. But if we gravitate from love, we make room for redemption and, and, and transformation to exist. If we be love, in action and correct everything that stands against love, then we can counter inequity with equity. And we can counter injustice with justice. And we can counter ignorance with accurate knowledge. And most of all, we can encounter love. We can counter love with, we can counter hate, excuse me, with love and effectuate real transformation. In closing, I want to invite you to join us for our next Beloved Community Talks. I told you we're going to have part two on July 13th. Uh, we will dive deeper with former American extremist Christian Pic Piccolini. Christian will share uh, his own journey of unlearning hate. Um, also joining that conversation is behavioral scientist and author Dr. Pregua Agual, Agual I, I can't say her name. Agarwal, I think that's it, Agarwal. Dr. Agarwal will provide us with practical tools, or Agarwal, Agarwal, Agarwal. <laughs> she will provide us with practical tools to engage in the unlearning process. So if you're tuned in tonight, you have to tune in on the 13th to get the rest. Speaking of unlearning, nonviolence is one of the most powerful tools for unlearning and shifting paradigms. I believe both my parents knew the power of learning, which is why they were able to employ nonviolence to dismantle unjust systems. If you want to learn more about our nonviolence and how to create transformative change in your life and in your community, join us for our Understanding and Applying Nonviolence June series, June 28th through July 1st. Of course, you can register at thekingcenter.org. You see there on the slide. And last but not least, we want you to be sure to visit our website and get involved in the Be Love movement and join us for our Be Love Day that will take place Friday, July 16th, 2021. 
It's a day to interrupt. We heard that word tonight. Lady Gaga said she interrupts these environments. So we're going to interrupt on that day injustice and all of the divisiveness and hate that has become normalized in society by setting aside one day to focus on the true power of love. The day will be utilized as a time to emphasize and express the kind of powerful compassion that transforms lives as well as unjust systems. We must interrupt the norm, as my dad said, and become transformed norm nonconformists so that we can create a new one moving forward. So join us now, visit our website and take the Be Love Pledge and let's make love our new norm. We've been talking about a new norm. That's the new norm. So that when you get off this uh, 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 Beloved For You Talks tonight in your household, whoever you talk to on the phone tomorrow, say my new norm is be love. I'm coming, I'm gonna gravitate from that place of love from this day forward. And I'm going to be on this journey to, to learn, to unlearn, to relearn what is true and what is um, powerful in terms of creating a more just, humane, equitable, and peaceful world. Thank you from the bottom of my heart so much for joining us uh, in this conversation with Lady Gaga. Um, she was... Uh, a, a very important seed for us tonight that I believe will reap a harvest. So until next time, continue to be safe and be loved.